Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul at Radio Free Hammer Hall here. And I've got a few gripes that I want to air out here. Uh, in particular, with the Skaven Battle Tome. There were a bunch of things that I was actually disappointed about in this book. Um, so I thought I would make a fun little video going through my top 13 gratuitous complaints about the Skaven Tide Battle Tome. Now, these are in no particular order. Uh, but all are uh, certainly some things that are some misses in this battle tome. Number 13. There are no additional prayers for your plague priests. Virtually every other book that has had priests has some sort of prayer lore for those priests. Even if specifically looking at the case of Stormcast, even if they also have spell lores. So I think it was definitely a miss here to not have additional prayers for the priests. It really makes like your plague priest on foot really pretty useless. And it leaves your plague furnace to have a really narrow function. So that is... Uh, definitely something that I wasn't too happy about uh, when I was looking through this book. Number 12. All of the clans share three of the same command traits. Now, this is something that has popped up in other books before. Um, a little bit here, I think, feels a bit like they, they were only kind of going like halfway with wanting to do command traits for all the clans. And it just feels like they should have done this in some different way. Either go with six original command traits for each clan, or have only three command traits for each clan. And those three traits that are in each clan are all pretty bad. Like, they're all pretty much a miss so I'm not really clear on why they did it this way definitely disappointing um, it, maybe the book would actually have been better off without those three and each clan just got three traits number 11 storm fiends have the clans molder keyword but in no way do they synergize with a molder army in any way other than if you are taking a 100% molder force, you can include storm fiends. That's the only upside there. Otherwise, you can't buff anything, you can't use any abilities, there's nothing in molder that touches storm fiends in any way. Definitely really disappointing, and it makes you wonder why that keyword even bothers to be there other than just for fluff reasons. Number 10. Scryer only got three spells. Um, and I would add on to this that two of them are kind of bad. There's Scryer basically just got one spell. Now, I just think this is really disappointing and in many situations you're probably going to want to run uh, two different uh, Scryer Wizards. I've definitely been toying around with lists that do that, and I ha I'm hard-pressed to actually justify doing that because I've only got three spells in the lore to pick from, and really only more, more, more warp power is really all that great. So it would be nice if our Scryer Wizards had more spells available to them, especially since they're really the most powerful wizards we have available in our army. Number nine, Vermin Lords. They're all double casters, but none of them can take a spell from any of your spell lores. So you're sort of left off with this weird situation where you've got these Vermin Lords, they all have one really good spell on them, and they can all cast and unbind two spells a turn. But what do you do with that second spell? It's very, very common 
that I end up just blowing it on a mystic shield, which is kind of silly. Um, you have these vermin lords that are supposed to be, you know, like the creations of uh, the great horned rat, but, you know, they, they don't have any sort of mastery of magic outside of a one spell that they know. It, that kind of seems like a fluff mix miss to me. Uh, maybe the uh, gracier spell lore could have been extended to vermin lords. Um, or just have their own spell lore in addition to that. I, I'm not really sure what the answer would have been. But it's definitely disappointing that they're all double casters and they, they don't have a spell lore to pick from. So a lot of times that's just going to get wasted. Number eight... Death Runners lost their scroll, even though Eshin is tiny, and Death Runners were awesome. It was just such a cool concept to have two models that really represent one actual model, and the other's an illusion. It was a really cool concept. Very disappointing that that scroll got cut, and it leaves us with a Clan Eshin that is really a non-starter it it doesn't really do anything number seven uh you can give a free command trait to verminous heroes but they're pretty much all terrible um the only two that i ever see myself using are giving a claw lord one extra wound or uh using the ability to get once per game getting extra attacks now, the funny thing is, is that this ends up actually being a non-bow with your uh, Vermin Lord because he, if he takes the one that gives him an extra wound, then he goes to 13 wounds and he can no longer use gnaw holes, he can no longer uh, skitter leap, you know, it, it it's just a crazy non-bow. And the... Really, you'd want to put the other command trait that gives you extra attacks on your Warbringer anyway, but it still feels like a miss here. That, that yeah, they, they get a free command trait, but it doesn't really do anything. So it's basically, Verminous effectively doesn't really have an Allegiance ability, if you kind of think of it in that sense. Number six. Eshin's Allegiance ability is really, really, really easy to forget. You've got to pick an enemy hero and then remember that what that en enemy hero is throughout the game, and then your Eshin guys get to reroll hits against that one hero for the rest of the game. Uh, this is the sort of ability that you're going to forget to even nominate anybody at the beginning of the game, let alone remember to actually use the ability really disappointing I, I it's just very annoying to me to have abilities like this i think flavor wise it's cool that eshin is the clan of assassins and you basically pick an assassination target but it doesn't it doesn't give you enough of a boost that you really remember that assassination target maybe if you had more of a reason to kill them Instead of getting a buff to kill them, if you got a bonus for killing them, then it would maybe feel a little bit uh, more worth remembering. Otherwise, a, a lot of heroes just end up staying in the backfield, and whoever you nominate, they're probably going to try and protect anyway. Number five. The Lore of Ruin is just powered down versions of the Verminous, or the Vermin Lord spells. So... In one way, these are all really, like, kind of unoriginal, and they didn't really write much of a spell lore. I think it's kind of cool, a little bit fluff-wise, that they take powered-down versions. But, in some cases, it, the there's an odd dichotomy where some of the powered-down versions are very much worse than the original, and there are some that take such a minor hit that 
they're essentially the same thing as the original. Like, uh, you know, Warp Gale versus Dreaded Warp Gale. Um, you know, you're talking about D6 Mortal Wounds instead of D3 Mortal Wounds between the Dreaded version and the Standard version. Um, and otherwise, like, the meat of the spell does the same exact thing, which is very powerful. Uh, but on the flip side, like, Skitter Leap versus Dreaded Skitter Leap, or Plague versus Dreaded Plague... Dreaded Plague is going to do a lot more damage. S Dreaded Skitter Leap actually gets you into an easy charge range, while Skitter Leap is getting a hero nine inches away from something. Uh, you know, your best case scenario is to Skitter Leap onto uh, an unguarded objective or off into a corner, or a weird spot that. Um, they don't necessarily need to attack immediately. Number four. The Warlock Bombardier is basically strictly better than the Warlock Engineer. And they're the same points. Like, the Bombardier is just so much more useful because he has that Doom Rocket. And the Warlock Engineer is just going to sit in the backfield and not do anything. You know, all of your scryer engineers slash wizards, they all kind of want to stay behind the lines and buff your guys. The bombardier at least gives you the ability to to make that attempt to fire off a doom rocket once a turn. Whereas the engineer just kind of sits there and is probably going to be out of range of all of his attacks the whole time. So that's... I always really don't like to see when there's two versions of a thing and one is just so much better than the other that you don't ever want to take the first one. Um, so I think that was it, kind of a miss here. They, The Warlock Engineer should have been more useful or less points or something. It, having them both be at the same point level and the Bombardier having, you know, an 18-inch shot that can do a lot of damage is, uh, it's kind of disappointing. Packmasters. They're units instead of heroes. And this is really annoying because in the Island of Blood box, uh, you got a solo Packmaster. Um... And a lot of people have that model, and it was recently repacked um, under a different name. So even more of those things floating around, and you know, suddenly you need the the unit of three of them rather than single models. And just as a side note, like it, they're they basically do the same thing as the master molders. So, uh, again, it's one of those weird things where it's like, I really wish that this was just a little bit different. It kind of feels like I'm never going to run Packmasters because I'm not going to buy those models. I'm not going to convert anything to be those models. And, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do with Packmasters. They're really a big disappointment. Number two, the battalions are kind of bad. And doing the math out on, for example, the Scryer Battalion, you have to spend so many points just in the battalion and needing to take at least two engineers and an Arch Warlock. It, there's just so many points that you have to dump into the thing. Very few of these are actually worth taking there are a couple that you might sort of take by accident um, you know the claw horde is basically your battle line units plus a claw lord and then and I'm blanking on the name at the moment one of the uh, clans pestilence battalions is two packs of plague monks and a plague furnace which is a very common way to be running that anyway 
But both of those give you very minor buffs, and there are a lot of points for the trouble. And I'm not entirely sure that they're really worth it. And, drumroll, kids, for the number one gratuitous complaint about the Skaven Battletome. It's really hard to dispel and recast the Warp Lightning Vortex. It is super annoying. If that thing gets in the wrong place, your opponent manages to wiggle their way out of it, it's basically stuck there. Maybe this is a decent thing to use your extra casting attempts off of your Vermin Lords, but they have a very bad chance of actually dispelling the thing, and then you have to recast it again. So it's very disappointing. I think this probably would have been better at a lower casting value. Um, is it, it the difficulty to dispel is really a problem. All right, kids, if you can't tell by now, a lot of this was basically a joke. Um, if you couldn't tell by the, the title of this, um, you know, maybe I'll get you a dictionary for Christmas. But really, the Skaven Battle Tome is really good. And a lot of these little things would have been great to see. But as it is, the Battle Tome is really, really strong. And uh, even as somebody that is playing the army, I can say... There need to be some points changes because it's just too good right now. Um, I, Ironically, I think the Warp Lightning Vortex may actually be better at a lower casting value so that it's easier for your opponent to dispel. Having a casting value of 8 is... Like, that is very achievable for Skaven. Having somebody dispel it on a 9 is very, very hard. It's going to be unlikely that your opponent's ever going to get rid of that thing. And your own ability to unbind it and recast it is probably better than your opponent's. So if this thing was at a lower casting value, you your opponent would have a better opportunity to unbind it in the first place and then later dispel it once it's in play. Um, because as it is now, you know, you take an Arch Warlock, you stand him next to a Gnaw Hole, and you eat a uh, bit of Warp Stone, and you fire that thing off across the table pretty easily. Um, a few of these things I would actually kind of would have liked to have seen. Um, you know, the Warlock Bombardier... Um, you know, to make it funny, yeah, I said the engineer should be less. I think it should be less because I think the bombardier should be more. It's definitely worth more than 100 points, I think. Uh, just trying to think through here some of these other examples. Um, the big thing with the Vermin Lords having two casts and two unbinds is that you have a lot of ability to cast powerful magic out of your gray seers and off of your warlocks but they also then give you that quantity of unbinds that just shuts down your opponent's magic you know it just makes it really difficult for your opponent to do anything and I feel like their their ability to unbind two is often stronger than their ability to cast two, even if they had a spell lore. Um, the lore of ruin I think is almost too good because you have all of these spells that are on two hundred sixty three hundred point vermin lords that have basically slightly powered down versions 
Most of them really are only slightly powered down. Like, Warp Gale's a joke. Um, like, that's... The mortal wounds are not why you cast Warp Gale. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know how they would have changed that to be a powered down version other than doing less mortal wounds. But Warp Gale doing D6 mortal wounds on top of stopping your opponent's movement like that is really powerful. Um, there's a lot of really good things in here. Um, another good example, too, is uh, Death Frenzy and Dreaded Death Frenzy. Like, sure, Dreaded Death Frenzy is great because it can target three units. But a lot of time, all you need is one. And if that one is a unit of juiced up plague monks good night that is a very dangerous unit anyway um so that's about it for now guys uh i hope you enjoyed this this was just me being silly going through some of my little complaints about the book um i think overall like a lot of these things in general would be nice if they were there but the flip side of it is really, number one, this book is already very, very good and it didn't need more tools in its toolbox. And number two, this book is also already very, very complicated and didn't need more tools in its toolbox to confuse the shit out of everyone. As it is, there's probably too much stuff in here uh, for you know reasonable selections there's so many options in this book so many things that you can do um buffing storm fiends out of molder would just be obnoxious if you could do that like i'm guessing in playtesting they were probably like molder fighting beasts when they were playtesting it and they just said no like letting letting these guys get a buff is ridiculous we can't do this um, there's there's a lot of good things in this book. Some of these, you know, I, I wish the book was more balanced so that you know, we could have had more of these things. I'm going to bet some of them were taken out. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Hope you guys enjoyed. I will talk to you all later.